All right, Trading Places came out almost 40 years ago. I think it's next month is the official anniversary. Chris Ryan, early 80s Philly. Yeah. Right around when you were born, right? 77 I was born, so I was six when this Or came you were out. a little kid. Right yeah. around as you're born as a movie fan right sure. around now. Yeah. Um, is this the apex for Philly for you? Let's just do Apex Mountain now. Yeah, I mean, Trading I was, places, Rocky Three, and Sixers win the NBA championship. Phillies go to the World Series. You know, everything's thriving as you can see from this film. The the, the city's never looked better. <laughs> it's a four <laughs> four minute credits in the beginning. It's awesome. Landis doesn't care. He's just like, let's just roll it. Liberty yeah. Bell, Italian Market. Let's go. Mm. What's your relationship with this movie, Van? So this was the first time I, I remember seeing Philly on screen and knowing that it was supposed to be Philly. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that I cared about Rocky in terms of Philly because I just want to see Rocky knock somebody out. But this was one of those childhood classics. Eddie Murphy was a staple, a holy person mm. in our house, like on the level of like Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. I guess he was kind of the, the movie star Michael Jackson at that point. He was the guy, right? Eddie Murphy, Prince, Michael Jackson. And so... We would watch like Eddie Murphy Saturday Night Live, that video of all of his sketches together. Yeah, and then we would watch this movie. I would watch it all the time. Me, my grandmother, my mother, and my sister. So it's like one of the early ones. Eighty to eighty four, just just one of the great four year runs of American pop culture for yeah. him. Eddie's my guy. We've done forty eight hours. We did Cop One and Two. We did Coming to America. We did Boomerang. Um, I think this is the last like giant the Eddie last, movie we like, haven't big done. Piece, yeah, it's the last um, Rushmore one. This comes out in eighty three. 48 Hours had already come out. I'd already seen that twice in the theater. SNL, Eddie was my guy. And this with Dan Aykroyd. He had the Blues Brothers connection with Belushi. He used to be in SNL. The Animal House director's doing it. There were big stakes. And then it exceeded the stakes. It was immediately a fantastic movie. Eddie was just amazing in it. And this was it. This launches Eddie to the fucking stratosphere. He is not only one of the biggest movie stars in the world, he's probably the biggest black movie TV person coming out of this movie, right? Yeah, well, I... I'm trying to think who the, else Who the, else is in that conversation in 1983. Pryor, right? I mean, Pryor... But, but Pryor this, this is like sunsetting for Pryor, Yeah, Pryor, Pryor right? is like, it's kind of ending for yeah. Pryor, and Murphy's just kind of grabbing the torch and taking it. At, at that... Right around that time, you're going to... I mean, Bill Cosby is going to be like a... But Cosby yeah. shows not till next year. It's not till the next it's year. It's 84. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Eddie was like, SNL, even though it was like, oh, SNL's not doing as well, it was still like 10 million a night. And Eddie was still like one of the few, you know, signature black characters on TV in the early 80s. There's also something to be said for the fact that when you go back and look at the box office performance for Trading Places and just a lot of movies, this was an incredible movie summer, much less yeah. year. It was a mm -hmm. definitive movie summer because I think it was like one where they almost had too much good stuff coming out. Yeah, it was like jockeying for the weekends. But the way that movies would last for months, which probably doesn't really happen even with hits these days, like even Guardians of the Galaxy 3, it's like that'll be like kind of in the rearview mirror in two more weeks or three more weeks. It moves too fast. Yeah, it moves too fast. Training Places like locked everything up for months. Did you say it was top 10 for 17 straight weeks? Get, get that through your head. That's crazy. Yeah, that's like <laughs> a... Freaking WNBA Yeah, season. that's people going to see it two, three times in the theater because yeah. you don't know when you're going to get to see it again. And and it's making it a part of your life. And I think because of that relationship with the stuff, people had a different kind of relationship with stars, you know? And stars had more more of a time, like, it, like they, they sucked up more time. You know, like Eddie Murphy could be the person of the year in a real way that I don't think anybody can do now. Yeah, so the energy has changed, right? Because of the IP domination, we care more about the character than the actor. Yeah, like, the star. Yeah, so you could ask the question, like, is Chris Evans a movie star? You could ask that question, mm -hmm. right? He's certainly a movie star, right? Because he's the star of... Captain like, America. Right, but is he a movie star in right. the way that movie stars are used to be? Probably, probably not, you know what I mean? And so at this point, you have... Like in Trading Places, Eddie Murphy, who is this crazy ascending star, and then Dan Aykroyd, who was a familiar, lovable face for a long time. And it seems like they're peaking. I mean, it, we talked about Apex Mountain and how what a, what a diff difficult thing it is to choose the Apex Mountain. For Aykroyd. For, for Aykroyd. But yeah. it seems like at this point, they're young, they're hungry, they're in their sort of creative sort of uh, sweet spot. Um, and the movie gets better like every single time you watch it, like it to to for me, and I've seen this movie 
Well, hold that because I want to talk about how brilliant this movie is yeah. constructed. The, right. the Eddie piece of this. Maybe I'm acutely aware of this because I'm a teenager, right? And I'm an only child and pop culture and sports like meant way too much to me. But it did feel like there was an era shifting right around 80, 82, 83, but really 83. Letterman's coming in now as like a real, as a real force. Eddie's taking over Saturday Night Live. You have movies that year, Tom Cruise, that's when Risky Business hits. Mm -hmm. You have Michael Keaton's coming off a night shift and he's becoming a big star. Um, that's Matthew Broderick that year with uh, with uh, War Games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it just, like Seinfeld, you start becoming aware of him. Letterman's having all these comics on and it just felt like the start of a different era, right? Whereas like the 70s is like Carson. It's like the tail end of the Rat Pack. It's, it's like all the Godfather guys and it's De Niro and Scorsese and all the movie directors. And it just, all that felt very 70s. It, feel, it felt like an 83 range we're moving toward this different kind of new generation of stuff. Howard Stern's involved in there too. He's in New York at that point. The John Hughes stuff is about the to start. John yeah. Hughes stuff's happening. Yeah. But MTV is hitting. Mm -hmm. And there's all this stuff for like teenagers that is in 70s. And Eddie's like at the forefront of it. He's the number one guy. Yeah. And I also love the fact that a lot of the movies that came out this year that were really popular, I mean, even just a couple you just mentioned, are kind of edgy. You know, yeah. like they're not safe. And mm. even when you watch Trading Places, you're like, you know, there's some stuff that's aged very poorly. There's also just some stuff that's like very confrontational that you wouldn't. I mean, when's the last time a movie has been made about a homeless person? <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Like, like, it's just like there's they just this film looks like a 70s film, but is about 80s stuff and 80s greed and 80s capitalism. And Eddie is like right in the fulcrum of that where he is like really, really likable and charismatic, but is like very confrontational and very provocative. And that's what this movie is. So the movie is interesting in that, like, I feel like one thing that's happened with the simplification of story is they want to give you mascots for bad, mm -hmm. right? They want to give you that this person, this person is bad. And so whatever happens, this person is going to be bad. Like when you look at this movie, they're obviously making, com there's obviously commentary on what is bad, but like Winthorpe goes... He starts off one way, hits the bottom, then becomes the thing that you thought that he wasn't. And then, so it's not actually that any of the people are like actually bad here. It's a way of looking at people that is bad. So to, to, to explain that be great. Well, but, but, but this is what I'm saying is <laughs> the, the reason why they're not great is because they're adhering to a view of humanity. Right. That yeah. makes them that makes them that way. Lewis, like, or he changes, like life changes, like Lewis changes, like uh, fucking Eddie Murphy's character. They change, they they change, right? And so that's movie making at a time where films had to be less sanctimonious. Where, well, and they weren't afraid to do satire back then as much either. Yeah, this movie's a satire, but it's edgy and it's smart and it's. I, I, I just it's think fucking it's funny. It's funny as hell and it's brilliantly constructed, right? Yeah. This movie moves like five different times. We're in the Lewis, Lewis section beginning, then the downfall of Lewis, the rise of, uh, of Billy Ray, mm -hmm. and then Lewis getting his retribution or, you know, coming back up, but then getting it. Well, he bottoms like, out four times. And then, yeah. and then when it's right at the darkest, darkest moment, that's when Billy's and then one like, of the hey, great don't endings. shoot me. Let's go get revenge. Yeah. And then one of the best endings ever yeah. with them on the fucking beach. It's like, hey, we've seen so many different films try to do that ending. And it's just perfect. Well, it, it, a lot of people commented when it came out and you can really see it when you watch it now. It's just a, a classic Hollywood screwball comedy. You yeah. Know? And even the part that probably works the least well anymore with the train sequence is very screwball. Like where it's just like, why is there a gorilla here? And there's like, yeah. oh, they're throwing so much stuff so at the wall. So eighties. Right. But like they, hijinks on a train on New Year's Eve or whatever. But it's all less than hour like, 55. Yeah. And like yeah. the idea of these two guys flip switching lives and what happens out of that. And like these, this, this sort of ensemble of characters who are all trying to make a kind of moral point about like the way life should be lived and the way the world should be viewed. That's 1940s. That's Preston Sturgis and Frank Capra and all the like the classic comedy directors of Hollywood. And they just update it so well. You know, I was, one other thing to be said. It's like when you go back and you look at the movie now, especially since I'm older, I watch it so much when I was younger. To see all of them as basically kids. Yeah. Especially Eddie. Eddie's like 21. To see all of them as basically like kids, they look 
so young. Like even Jim Belushi. Dude, yeah. see John Carl Esposito in this did my head in. Yeah. Al Franken <laughs> yeah. pops up in the movie. Like, I was just on, you know, Al's old. You know what I mean? So like yeah. Al Franklin pops up. The dad up. from 902 and 0, he pops up. <laughs> Eckhouse, yeah. <laughs> James <Right>. Eckhouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this movie comes out, Paramount signs Eddie to a $25 million five film contract and agrees to finance his production studio. That was one outcome. Another outcome was this comes out June 8th. SNL season's already done. And it's like, oh, Eddie's going to leave SNL, which was like a, a big deal. He mm -hmm. was like carrying the show by himself. So it's like, is SNL going to get, he's clearly has to leave. He's going to become this major movie star. Um, it proved that he could carry a second movie. And then for the Aykroyd piece, you know, Belushi's dead at this point. They were filming the movie when Belushi was alive, but Belushi's going down. But he was always the Belushi sidekick. Mm -hmm. And it was always like the Abbott and Costello. Oh, if you take away the one guy, the other guy's going to fall apart. It was the opposite. He does this movie and he does Ghostbusters. But hey, yeah. he was considered to be, oh, you don't want him as, he was, what was it, Dr. Detroit? Then he does Neighbors with Belushi and... His movie career was disappointing. Like, he kind of needed this more than Eddie. Eddie yeah, so was going to have more hits. So did Landis. Landis yeah. was in the same zone. Yeah. Um, but the Ackroyd thing, I knew him from SNL when they started showing the primetime SNL. So I fell in love with Belushi, obviously, like everybody did. And then Blues Brothers was the seminal moment that I don't feel like, probably for people under 35, I don't know if Blues Brothers matters. I think if they, I think Blues Brothers is one of the movies from that era where, like, if we showed it to, the guys in this room who are younger, they would just be You're like, not gonna get it. this is super boring. What yeah. is the fuck is it's this? It's definitely long. And when we're like, Aretha Franklin is here. Like, you're right. like, no, right. nobody really is. It's like, one of those, it, it's kind of one of those, like, it, the 80s had these movies that I used to call like dream movies to where it felt like it was just in a haze of stars and concepts being thrown at you. And cocaine. And yeah, yeah. And now we're in the car and we're like, we're going crazy and goddamn Julius Irvin shows up. Right. And you, know what, you know what I mean? And it's, and it's like all of those. Yeah. And it was weird. And then at one point they just stopped making movies like that. And now when you show those types of films to people, they're going to be like, what the hell is Aretha Franklin doing here? Like, why in the Modern world? Modern Province with Chevy Chase is, is like that. Or it's yeah. like, was just everybody just blowing lines as they were filming this? Between well, the, takes? The, the car chases in Blues Brothers are the cokiest thing in movie history. Where you're just like, has sunglasses the whole time. Yeah. He, doesn't, he doesn't even want anyone to see his eyes. Um, so yeah, Aykroyd needed this one because it was like, what? Is this guy anything or not? You know, he's this brilliant. He was kind of the first of the Phil Hartman... Will Ferrell, yeah. like those guys who could do all the different characters. He was an amazing cast member. It was unclear whether he'd go on anything. Then Jamie Lee Curtis was just a horror movie person. Like she's in Halloween 1, Halloween 2. She's in Terror Train, Prom Night. Scream Queen. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of what she, what all she was. So the fact that she was the sexy hooker in this movie was like, whoa. Dark times for my mother. Super Why? dark. Because I was like a kid, right? And... I remember my mom was trying to make sure that I stayed with the sisters. Mm. And there was two people. It was her and it was Vanna White. Was she your first first team white girl? So the first first team, <laughs> the first the first starting white girl five is is <laughs> this, this is a big text thing with Vanna. It's first team all white girl. Yeah. Like you have a team of because I'm with the sisters. Because I remember when Shiv Roy made it and it was like, whoa, is this too early for Shiv Roy? She made it. Shiv made it. You know, she whatever. Okay, so like, like she, 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 <laughs> like she was on the team. She was on a team. So you know? Jamie Lee Curtis was in the inaugural team. The inaugural, yeah. Wow. Yeah, she was on the in like the, the founding fathers. But but this was also like influenced by dad. Yeah, because dad, we were watching the movie and dad be like, "God damn, that thing bad right there." <laughs> and mom would be like, "Okay, that's enough. All right, yeah. now when it happens." When he when he when he comes in here, he's like OJ Simpson. You're gonna feel bad about it. He's like that ain't gonna happen to that boy. Ain't no white girls even around here. Uh, rewind. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but yeah. So, but she, I didn't know nothing, right? Because you know I wasn't the screen old queen enough. Background. Didn't know the screen queen thing. Dad would be like, "That's Tony Curtis's daughter." I'd be like, "Who the fuck is Tony Curtis?" You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know you anything. You were rocking Spartacus. Like, no, yeah. I, I, I knew nothing except for that. This is the first time I can remember her. Well, producer Craig mentioned before we started taping about how this was the gratuitous nude scene era, which yes. it was. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the nude scene that she has in this movie was incredibly important for the movie and for her career. We didn't know it was coming. It wasn't like the Halle Berry swordfish we know two months in advance. It's not a, a sex scene. scene. 
And it just kind of comes out of nowhere. And it's like, oh my God, yeah. like this is the girl from Halloween, Halloween too. You're going to do that. But it became a big thing for, I think her career. I don't know if she's crazy that it happened all these years later, but it was a sign I am not the horror movie person anymore. I am now. Yeah, when she an actress shows up in a movie in a and she's asking for heroin from Lewis, it's like, oh, we're we're oh, like this is a different doing vibe this now. from yeah. By the way, Craig, get that woke shit out of here, bro. <laughs> we trying to have fun watching movies, bro. Are like, you not? Like, you not? You not about to come? No, I'm, I'm, makes a I'm good as point, woke though. as they come. Like I'm all the way to the left of the. But sometimes we just gotta watch Jamie Lee. But <laughs> Yeah, there's a line to be drawn, bro. Craig going, I didn't like it. Shut up, Craig. I didn't say I didn't like it. No, he <laughs> just said he noticed it. I just it. pointed it out. It's yeah. just a staple of the 80s. It's odd. This was in 1983. Yeah. 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 You're like, yeah. That, did that have anything it, to do with anything? It's a seminal no. moment for me and my sexual awakening, but it is <laughs> strange when you're just like, ah, she's explaining like, you know, how the house works. When is the right. last time you saw a movie that a no, nobody movie does this with anymore. a gratuitous nude scene. Yeah. No. yeah, it just kind of doesn't. This happen. was right. the the '80s had entire movies that were gratuitous. Like Porky's is just a series no, of Porky's dialogue is... scenes with nudity. Yes. Porky's is so bad. I try to watch it while I was on vacation. Porky's is terrible. <laughs> you can't watch Revenge Porky's. of the Nerds. Yeah, that no, movie yeah, is Revenge also of the Nerds. Bad, yeah, bro. like this is so bad. Yeah, it's like we're gonna infiltrate the sorority. Police Academy has a lot of like that yeah. stuff. This is the era. <laughs> yeah, I'm not not. I'm not defending it. I'm just saying this <laughs> is was, what it was. What like. it was. Yeah. This yeah. is what it was. John Landis, the director, in the span of uh, 10 years, bangs out Animal House, Blues Brothers, Trading Places, and Coming to America. Yeah. And there's unfortunately some, for him. There's some, some, some valleys there. Yeah. yeah. I'm just saying those, if you're just pulling it away, those are four titles. Much like Craig's Warriors won four titles, but then had these other seasons where they oh, didn't make Jesus the playoffs. Christ. They lost in a playing game. They also game. went to two more finals. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but but his career got overshadowed because he had the Twilight Zone accident. That was a tragedy. Yeah, the onset Multiple deaths. people died. Helicopter crashed in the water, killed some actors and some kids who probably shouldn't have been working at midnight. And that took over, you know, the 80s. And even though he made Coming to America after Trading Places, his his career was never really the same. Yeah, he had, and he and Eddie... One of the things that you read about this movie is that, like, everybody on it is like, that was one of the best times I ever had making a movie. Mm. And I think that he and Eddie really connected. And then Eddie, like, kind of brought him out of, like, a little bit of a director jail to do Cop 3. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, that was much later. Yeah. yeah. But well, like, the other thing is Eddie wasn't a superstar yet when he filmed this. He was an SNL star. They had they were he, watching 48, 48 Hours. hours like, they yet. were watching, like, yeah. like... They saw screenings of it so, like, they could test it, basically. Yeah. And Landis was like, oh, my God. So by the time Eddie does Cop, he's like Elvis. You know, it's just different. On this set, he's still the 21-year-old kid who can't believe he's making a movie with all and these And he's people. bullshitting with Ralph Bellamy yeah. and Don Amici on Hanging the set. out with his old guys. Landis was one of the most recognizable faces to me as a director because of Thriller. Yep. Yep. So, like, when you would watch the making of Thriller, which I've seen the making of Thriller. So many times. As many times as I've actually seen it's a great point because it was on MTV for like yeah. all the five months straight. Right. So that's another point about like you have to under like you had 10 things and that's all you rocked with <laughs> for right. a year. Right. You know? like, yeah, just, like I probably watched a say hey hey say 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 video with McCartney and Michael Jackson, which is a terrible song and a worse video a hundred times. Yeah. Yeah. Like a million times yeah. to the point to where like you got so used to seeing it that it seemed like it was like always mm -hmm. on. Um so I knew that. It was John Landis. He was, he was a big deal. And it seemed like he was doing all the movies that I liked. So early on, like he was one of the first directors. I was like, oh, John Landis did this. So I'm kind of interested in it. Who else was on first team? The inaugural in first the team all-white girl? And uh, So it's going to be... <laughs> Jamie Lee. Jamie Lee, Vanna White. And then later on in the decade, you got Kelly Kapowski. Yeah. Okay. So do you this, include Valerie Malone with Cal is it by both of them because the same actress? Valerie Malone. Not two and oh? No, by, when by she, the 90s. When she grew, grew up? By the 90s, the team had totally changed. Okay. Because yeah. gotcha. by 92, I'm really starting to understand. Mallory Keaton. They'd gotten make a different it? GM. Keaton, no, in, I was never. They stripped down the roster, yeah, built it back up like, again. Put, yeah, like, Kirstie Alley? No, no. Although summer school, I could first of all, if Kirstie Alley was on the team right now, I wouldn't be able to admit it because of things that happened later on. But uh, but summer school, like I was like, yeah, she's amazing. Oh, you know who was? Who? Speaking of summer school and Revenge of the Nor Nerds, Courtney Thorne Smith. Oh, was great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Courtney Thorne Smith was on. Future yeah. Melrose Playstar. Mm -hmm. So this movie, 
this is the background of this movie. There's some good stuff about it, but it was, uh, the, one of the writers, Timothy Harris, he played against, played tennis against these two wealthy brothers who would just bitch and they were super cheap and, and he would come home and he would just be mad that he hung out with these and guys. And he lived like on Fairfax in a pretty rough part of LA at the time. Right. And he was like, man, like the, the, the juxtaposition between the way these guys live and where I am. So he gets this idea of these two brothers that become whatever. And then he gets his partner, Harris Weingrad. They research commodities. They find out about, there's this thing called Silver Thursday. Mm -hmm. The Hunt brothers tried to corner the silver market. And they decide this will be the movie. There'll be these two guys and there'll be a chase. So they kind of start sketching all of it out. They used a little bit, uh, probably from the Prince and the Pauper, Mark Twain's thing, because it's a little similar there. Uh, they decided to make orange juice and pork bellies instead of the typical stuff, just because it's a little more relatable. And they're off and they construct it and they make it. And it's one of those rare scripts that's just like pretty flawless. It's so gotta tight. say, mm -hmm. it's so tight. The, you you alluded to the beats. It's basically like, what is it like? Fifteen minutes to Eddie shows up. I think Jamie Lee shows up 45, 50 minutes into the movie. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like the way that they just like they do like these little like the the acts are so perfectly it's played like the out. The train section, the commodity section, yeah. mm -hmm. everything like in your head. It's just it's all segmented. And it's one of those also you know when you're writing the screenplay, every every scene is supposed to obviously say something, but most movies that you watch, you go, God damn, they really could have lost that scene. You know what I mean? They really could have got rid of that. Yeah. But in this one, almost every single, especially at the beginning, every single scene of the movie tells you something so important about the character. Yeah, like the party scene at, at the house when Eddie's starting, to, Billy's starting to turn and he's starting to be like, now that I own shit, I he's don't want people putting cigarettes yeah. out. And yeah, I mean, there's that. I also think that like, it's rare that you, when you watch this movie and you're like, the f 17th character in this film is so perfectly cast. Yeah. Where it's even the guy who's like, yeah. yeah. Like, that guy I is perfect. That guy. Bill right. Cobb being the bartender is or perfect. Or the two cops who pick up yeah. Eddie and his legs drop. Like, you even were those guys are great. Yeah. <laughs> we were numb. Where was I? Sang, dang, dang, dumb. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this movie got an Academy Award nomination. Elburn Bernstein scored the film and the score is like such a huge part of yeah. this. I always forget um 50 million dollar budget made 120.6 million 50 million dollar budget 15 oh 15 i was about to say shit fourth biggest film of 1983 what were the other top ones jedi was in there i don't know i can i can look it up when we do the break roger ebert three and a half stars he loves story Quote, this is good comedy. It's especially good because it doesn't stop with sitcom manipulations of its idea, and it doesn't go only for the obvious points about race, racial prejudice in America. Instead, it develops the quirks and peculiarities of its characters so that they're funny because of who they are. All right, at Chris Ryan's request, I'm giving you the top 10 in 1983. Here we go. Star Wars, Return of the Jedi. Star Wars, that's a, like a space movie? Just continue. Read Is that the one movie. with the lightsabers Just and shit? Do the thing. Tootsie, Flash Dance, Trading Places, War Games, Octopussy, Staying Alive, Risky Business, Mr. Mom, and National Lampoon's Vacation. Wow. Oh. Superman 3, 48 hours if you want to go top 12. Mm. Superman 3 is bad. I like it. It's bad. It doesn't what a time late. to be alive, man. Time. 48 hours came out on December 10th. And made enough money after the New Year started that right. Eddie ended up being in the top 12 for both. All right, we're going to do most rewatchable scenes. Man, this is going to be hard. First one, opening credits. Love it. Got to be in montage. there for CR, yeah. right? Yeah. Jesus. Also, like, you get such a sense of what time of year it is where it's set. I don't know. I mean, it's just like, it, make, it makes me misty even thinking about it. Makes me jealous. I got to make a movie... So I can put a Baton Rouge montage in there. You know, McKinley High, mm. LSU Stadium, the State Capitol. You know what I mean? Boiling Rue, places of the Delpit's Chicken Shack. What time of year would you set your Baton Rouge movie? Uh, where the climate is going to be the most conducive for this. Because I don't like to go home after July. <laughs> <laughs> like just boil the house. So it's like March. I love March. It's a March yeah. madness. Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge then you have to movie. find one day that is not raining. But it's such a it, it's it's such a um 
an amazing uh, setup for the city, which is a character in this film. Yes. And all the characters in the movie are set up really well. Like when the first time you see Billy yeah. Ray, the first time you see Winthrop, he walks in there. He's obviously where well, you see him and he's, he's getting shaved. He's pampered. He hasn't really had anything. And, and the city is the first thing that they set up to kind of give you the aura there. How about the Rocky statue being in the credits? Yeah. It's a little across the beams, but I like sure. it. Sure. Yeah. It's Ro- like, oh. like Rocky. When did they put that statue up, dog? Pretty During soon Rocky after, 3. Yeah. Oh, after Rocky 3, they just throw it up there. Yeah. Interesting. Go for it. Next one. Eddie realizes he has legs. <laughs> I can walk. <laughs> Praise I can Jesus. See. I can see. I um, love you guys. You, the two of you. And then he bumps into Winthrop when he's leaving. And uh, and does, for some reason, grabs the briefcase and walks around, leading to all the guns being pointed at him, which is the Blues Brothers callback. Yeah. yeah. Which I really enjoy. Um, Eddie's just, like, leaping off the screen. <laughs> I mean, that's the first time we see him. It's like, oh, my God, they're just uh-huh. letting Eddie cook. This yeah. is great. The Dukes make the offer to Billy Ray, <laughs> which is, <laughs> they pick him up. I like when he leans forward and talks to the chauffeur. Thank you. You've been helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, well, let, yeah, no, no, I believe I can hang out with you guys a little longer. I like when he calls him Randy and Morty. Yeah. It's fucking, Randy, it's just, Morty. It's just, this is my TV. Yeah. <laughs> this is my TV. You say all of this stuff. This is my slave. <laughs> um. Billy Ray, oh, I guess that's part of this too, but Billy Ray getting to know his place after Winthrop gets framed when he breaks the vase, that whole part. You want me to break something else? Oh, yeah. No! You want some middle of lemon shit? This might be the winner for me. It's in the running. Eddie goes to a bar, sees the two guys from the jail, <laughs> throws a party. <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucker? Moi? <laughs> <laughs> Who's been putting out their cools on my floor? Um... Every piece of this is just like, yeah, bit, probably a tactical mistake. Maybe just stay in the bar, Eddie. Billy no, Ray. but like you're, you're like you want to show off what you've got. Yeah, I guess. What I mean? What's the point? I don't know. Probably good at the bar. I got your little measly twenty seven dollars. He throws the money <laughs> with interest. <laughs> with interest. <laughs> um, the Christmas party, which I'm gonna go all the way through, and when, when uh, Billy Ray overhears the bet, but we get. Salmon in the Santa Claus suit, which Jesus I want to want to dive into later. Eddie, um, after they pull away uh, Louis, when he's taking the drugs and putting them in a bag, and he sees the one <laughs> joint and he pockets it. Uh-huh. In the bathroom combo, um, where he has to like, keep the, the the inhale. At he has end. to swallow all that stuff. Just like, whew. um, Louis wakes up and sees. Billy Ray. It was the Dukes. It was the You're Dukes. a dead man, Valentine. <laughs> um, the trading scene. And then uh, one of the great endings. What do you got? Uh, the only addition that I would throw in there is Billy Ray in jail, which is still to this day, like one of the three or four funniest scenes in movie history to me. Yeah, you're right. It, uh, there wasn't another funny jail scene until Chris Tucker and Money Talks, which was <laughs> fucking hysterical. But like, just him talking about being a karate man. Karate man bruise on the inside. Karate man bruise on the inside. Quarter blood technique. All of that stuff. I'm going to go ahead and just do it. The phone in the limo is busted. The phone in the limo. What are you, did I, ignorant? Did I tell you? <laughs> My hoes, Mr. Big Time Pimp. You would know that because you're a big Barry White looking motherfucker. So I'm going to go ahead and do it just because I, yeah. I wouldn't be me if I didn't do it. Obviously, you guys are trying to be, you know nice and PG with the because you got your sponsors on the rewatchables and stuff but you're on the rewatchables it's like what are you talking about I don't know where this is going but I'm excited but I'm telling you if we're going to talk about what are the rewatchable scenes of the movie obviously the two Jamie Lee Curtis I had that in what stage the best (laughs) right right but we can do it now obviously those scenes are by far the most rewatchable of rewatchable scenes I think that you should say what you said to us about this that scene because I think it's honestly like the blur of the century and I can't sum it up any better. It was a watershed event. <laughs> yeah. It really was. It's a, it's like a top five nudity, unexpected nudity in a movie right. that I think really impacted an entire generation of young males. I imagine like when the first people saw that movie in theaters, they ran out of the movie theater like Lincoln had been shot to tell everyone else. <laughs> Like, it was like extra, extra. It's just nudity was, uh, listen, we're just being honest. Nudity was just way more of a commodity in the early 80s. Yes. Yeah. We had no accessibility to anything. 
And on top of it, it was somebody who we all liked from all the horror movies and it was just came out of nowhere. And I'm not, by the way, when I'm saying this, I'm just being my honest self. I'm speaking to who I truly am. By the way, if you go back and look at those scenes, she knows she's about to fuck you up. Cause like she like she she like she does. Because like even the, the second time it's like Steph smiling at the foul. Oh, right. It's, it's like she knows she's about to fuck you up. Cause the like the second time, I watched it a couple of times, you know, when I was watching the movie. The second time, his character can't even see her. Right. Like he's turned yeah. the other way. And she still goes. And I'm like, oh, Jamie, get him. Get him, Jamie. Yeah. And she gets in there. He doesn't even know that she's topless. The only people who know are us, the audience. So she knows I'm about to bust their motherfucking heads again. It was a watershed moment. What do you have for most rewatchable? It's the trading floor. The trading floor scene is, yeah. yeah. That, that's the number one most rewatchable. It's like maybe the, if you if you want to say one thing about the problem with comedies is that like there's never anything. You, they don't know how to end comedies. Because the point of a comedy is to be funny. You're not really trying to make like a, a plot arc that resolves in a really satisfying way. And this is like a fucking bank heist when yeah. they do this. This is if you're flipping channels and Jamie Lee and uh, Coleman are dropping them off at the train station. Yeah. And he's here's him, my money. It's yeah. everything I had. We're like, all right, I'm in for the next yeah. 25 minutes. And the fact that, he, that Mortimer or Randolph, one of them falls out and he goes, your brother, he's not well. Fuck goes, him. Fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> like, that just is the capper. Yeah, Amici. Well, yeah, yeah, Amici's like, fuck him. It's like, that's the capper of the, like, entire yeah. thing. I agree with you guys. What's age the best? Young Eddie Murphy. Mm -hmm. The look at that S car go just fucking kills me. It's a terrible joke. It gets me every time. The guy's set up. The guy's so cheap. He's got that weird fucking toupee. I have the the, uh, the judge's girlfriend as a sneaky Dion Waiters mm. uh, ah, candidate. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we mentioned the opening credits, the score. So I like when the Dukes explain commodities to Billy Ray, and he says, it sounds to me like you guys are a couple of bookies, because that's ba was basically my interpretation, too. Mm -hmm. They basically they get a vig from everything. What's age the best? Coleman the butler. Then you, like Elliot, yeah. you want to do Mount Rushmore now for butlers? For butlers. Well, it's him. Alfred. Tim Curry from Clue. Mm -hmm. The guy from Arthur. Oh, Hobbs from Arthur. Yeah. Great. Um, we we had one more. Was there so, a butler in Annie? Was Did Annie have a friendly butler? Oh, Jeffrey from um The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Oh uh, yeah. I put him up there. This is a great one. was a great butler. So but does does the Alice from the Brady Bunch, does she count as a butler or is it made as a different category? Is butlering still a thing, though? That's what I want to know. Mr. Belvedere, was he a butler? I feel like, wasn't he like the caretaker of the children? I guess he was yeah. a butler. But like, those guys. But they were just like in a suburban home. It wasn't like he had to go like dust. Coleman's, what a fucking amazing butler he was. Except he could for the fact cook. that he lied to his original boss like the entire time because he was like, I mean, he could have ended this movie in minute 16 by being like, they're fucking with you. But he way. felt bad about it, though. You yeah. could see, like, yeah. when he was telling them, Coleman was a good morality stick for the movie because he was, like, chained to the Dukes. He could not move yeah. away from them. But you could see it in his face the whole time. Great little performance, right? You could see it in his face that it was killing him because he had some kind of connection to this guy. You know what I mean? Love. Oh, I, I, I forgot a scene, rewatchable scene. I'll just say this real quick. The scene where Billy Ray finally proves his worth to the Dukes. Oh the, yeah, the, the kung fu Thought grip, yeah, there. and the entire joint like that. Yeah, that's an amazing wow. scene, and that's a I very important had that scene. In there. In he just saved us three hundred and forty-seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I love Randolph and Mortimer. The chemistry of the two guys. Yeah, it's just so fun to watch those guys act together. Two old guys. Like Ralph Bellamy was like eighty when he filmed this. Amici was seventy-four. But just, you really believe they're brothers. They're give and take and it, just everything. I thought it would, they're they also just really just, good. They're so, such pros that they deliver the setup to the movie so well. The nature versus Yeah, they're not trying thing. to be villains. Yeah. The villain stuff is all inherent. I, uh, this is subtle, but when the gorilla hits Beaks and then they're like, what are we going to do with the, with Beaks? And they look at the grill and the girl's like, ah. yeah. <laughs> he makes that noise. It always kills me. There's some amazing, amazing, subtle, rich guy stuff in here that I wrote down some of the stuff I liked. The opening when Winthorpe, when he gets ready and he goes, he, go, he gets all dressed and he goes out and Coleman is behind him. 
and he just stands by the door waiting for Coleman to open the yeah. door for like three seconds. Fucking lights out. Squash being like part of everybody's life and the squash club, perfect. The Heritage Club, they show that Heritage Club, it just seems like the racist, most whitest yeah. place Stupidest, you could ever yeah. go. Penelope, his girlfriend, <laughs> whose nickname is Muffy. Muffy. Like Penelope wasn't, uh -huh. wasn't like a white enough name for her. I love the Exeter and Harvard drops. And then my favorite is the Constant Fry song. Oh my God. The Muffy in the bathroom stall, Margaret by the lake, <laughs> Susan down in Ridgely Hall, Constance on the make. Constance will fulfill your needs winter, well, spring, or fall. fall. Yeah. What the fuck was going on with Constance? I don't know. <laughs> you know she took, seemed good with it, too. It took me a long time as a kid to understand that song. Yeah. Like, it was well, it's, it's also it's really funny because when they song. finish right. it, when they finish it, they turn to each other and go, that was great. Right. Yeah, great job. <laughs> and she's right there as they're talking about how easy she is. Yeah. But she, I mean? it seemed like she was with one she of was, them. Yeah, she was on the, she was There's in a lot the going on in that bit. scene. The, uh, another rich guy moment is when um, Penelope and Louis are having dinner and Den Denim and Elliot's making them dessert and he's like, <laughs> they're about to go screw so he's like, you know what, when, you know, Coleman, you have we'll have our drinks in the study. And he's like, what about dessert? And he's like, you have it. Right. right. <laughs> you take it. You oh, the five hour tips, away. another one. Yeah. It's just the rich guy stuff's <laughs> great. I like uh, when Muffy was like, you're a heroin too. It's like, it wasn't heroin, it was angel dust. PCP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what's age the best? Coming to America. We get to see, uh, we get to see Mortimer yeah. and Randolph again as, as bums. Mm hmm all right, this is a great one. So Penelope lights out in this movie. Just lights out. Throwing 98 every like scene. Oh, yeah. Mm. Great. Two IMDb credits total. Trading Places and she was in Manhunter, a Chris Ryan favorite. And that's it. Oh, that's a fucking Nothing else. fantastic That's her entire movie. IMDb. Yeah. She was a famous model from the 70s. And just kind of dabbled in acting and then got married. And that was it. She's Ansel Elgort's aunt. What? That's all I got for That's you. Who, who did she marry? She married some, some guy like, like a biology right? professor. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You want to talk about how she's not ride or die enough for you, though? Not at all. Why? So it's not that, okay, first of all, you're supposed to stay with him. He had a little legal trouble. You was in the house. You know what I mean? You guys were doing the whole thing. You're supposed to stay with him. He got He got one charge. I'm saying one charge. You're supposed to stay down. I feel like, I but feel she like, was the big catch in the group, though. She was playing everybody against each other until she wasn't, the wedding. She wasn't constant fry meeting people by the lake. That's fine. Know? Then she ended up fucking with his homie from Todd. the Heritage Club, Todd. Todd. But Todd was, it felt a little love triangle to me. Todd was, was the in the batter circle for a while. Yeah, Todd the was. The on deck circle. What, Every time what this kind guy of was society out. society do y'all live in? You let me get out of uh, you jail and, let, and, let, and figure out that my girl is fucking with one of my homies from the, I don't even want you to date one of the guys I play ball with. Let, let alone your wit. That's what, she fucked, she, come man. on, man. And this, this is what the Dukes knew. The Dukes knew that Everyone in his life would turn on him. Yeah. These were the, the original Murdochs. Yeah, oh, exactly. Murdochs. Oh, Murdochs? Yeah. Murdochs. Murdochs like the Fox News Murdochs or no, the Murdoch the, family? The, the Murdoch family. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this is it. Yeah. They're just dark. Um, <laughs> another would say the best. The big ending in the, in the orange juice and the short selling, which none of us understood as it was happening for years and years and years. And I still don't totally understand. I read an explainer about it. I read an explainer oh. too, and I 95% understood it. Okay. But I still don't totally understand it. And to me, that's age the best because I don't think it matters. All that matters is they did what they did and it worked out and they ended up on an island. It doesn't get bogged into, we don't have the extra two minutes of somebody like, so here's what they're doing. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. They just like, you know, they're. It's a very it, buying and selling. They, they bought low and they sold high. I didn't understand any of that stuff until I watched the big short. And then I had to dedicate myself to understanding it. Yeah. Um, I still don't understand the commodities market that much, but I just know that they were, and that's why the crop report is such an important plot device. Right. Because knowing that they have the real information from the crop report lets you know that they were able to do something that the Dukes weren't able to do because they had the wrong yeah, information. There's a, Craig, did you understand it? Not fully. No. All right, I'm going to explain it really fast. So you do futures, you can buy a future stock at whatever price you want but without yet owning it. But when the time comes to own it and pay for it, you have to have 
the money ready. You're buying a contract, and there's like X amount of oranges, I say, think. on that contract, and then you're buying like what you think the price of it will be at a certain. So point. they sell it at one forty five, one dollar forty five cents per unit. And they're selling it, and people are buying it. But the reason they're selling it is because they know it's then going to drop, yeah. and right. then they can rebuy it at the twenty nine cents. So they know how many. They know how so many. They made, they everybody, they everybody's money in the first place, and then they buy it for much cheaper. So they right. they basically matched the amount that they owed down the road after a crash for like twenty nine cents. And they force a margin thing. call. On you them. get a dollar difference thing, and you're ready to roll. And then yeah. the Dukes had to pay because of the margin call, which broke them. Yeah, the they, Dukes they, they, bought it up without realizing it was going to drop way right. below. Right. I think that's, I think we did that correctly. Um, so if you invested 1 million bucks, the way this is all laid out, they would have made about 5.4 million bucks. Mm. So it's like about it's five like and a half times. Inflation's like three to one. So it's about, they would have made like 15 in, in our, our time. So the question is, like we can do this now, the probably unanswerable question is how much money did they actually invest? Because they make, they're on an island and in a boat, but I they, I don't think they're there the rest of their lives. They might have just been vacationing. Like Google vacation. They didn't make like $300 million. I no. I mean, basically all the cash they had was from Jamie Lee Curtis's savings and Coleman's savings. Right. So, I mean, in that case, they had enough to do two things. One was to bankrupt the Dukes, which is yes. what they really wanted to do. Yes. And then two was to get them back in the game. Yeah. Right. Like, to keep them in the game. Yeah. Any other what's age the best for you, CR? Uh, the moment when Eddie Murphy looks at the camera when oh the deadpan Bellamy's yeah. like, which you might find in a, a bacon, bacon lettuce and tomato sandwich, <laughs> uh, and just Eddie just looks at the fucking camera. It's like that's a real Landis thing, and I, yeah. I love that. And then there they is that a, in Blues Brothers, too. a trilogy of people throughout the movie. Uh, basically, like when Beaks turns to the lady at the payphone and just goes, "Hold on a second, fuck off." Yeah. <laughs> And when Coleman this is asks, a great character. when this is Coleman great. asks uh, Billy if he wants him to pass more hors d'oeuvres, and he goes, "Fuck them!" <laughs> right. Like, there's just so many good, like, random, like, f bombs in this movie. That's random f bombs is, is, is the best. I like. I think Coleman is aged the best. Oh. I love Coleman. Like when Coleman is putting the fur on the one lady at the party and he's like Jesus Christ Coleman ain't never seen no shit like that yeah. <laughs> like being like like being what's his name and and knowing that it, Coleman's story is pretty cool like I, maybe I have to be a little older to, to, to like be uh, for it to like resonate with me but he's been like a servant his whole life yeah and everyone was content to have him in that role until this brother comes along that kind of makes him a part of the team because Billy Ray isn't used to yeah. talking then down. Then he asks Ophelia if they want to go have a stiff drink. Right. <laughs> at the Ray. Yeah, he's feeling himself. He's like, so Coleman is the Coleman is the man. So when I looked at that, I'm like, oh, that's a that's a story right there. The Kid Cuddy Pursuit of Happiness Award for Best Needle Drop. What do we have for I this? got Zeta Kai Anthem. Oh, that's good. Okay. You're right. <laughs> oh, I like I like uh What's what's the song that when they're in Billy Ray's house? Oh yeah. Do you want a pump? Oh, that's when the, the ladies got like <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is good. Right. Yeah, you're right. right. <laughs> the Big Kahuna Burger Award for best use of food and drink. I think best use would be the the crepe Suzette. Yeah. That's what uh Coleman was making them for dessert that they told him to I go like eat that. and then he puts in the garbage. The grossest use is the Santa Claus I, can salmon. We talk, can we wait for a second to talk about the salmon? Because I, I have something to say about that. Let's let's wait. <laughs> okay. Den of Thieves Benny Hanna Award for scene stealing location. I have the stock exchange floor. Mm, I like the whole setup. Yeah. So I have the giant conference room where Winthrop gets framed. Oh yeah. I like that wide shot. With it just the, fucking looks eyes wide shreddy. Yeah. yeah, it's mm -hmm. just like the creepiest. Great shot order where most cinematic shot. It's gotta be the ending. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the We're beach, on the fucking island. Yeah. yeah, I love it. All right, the Vincent Chase Award for Are We Sure This Character Was Actually Good at His Job? <laughs> Beaks, just fucking fly. Why are you on an Amtrak? Well, the, the other thing gave you Beaks, all this money, just get on a fucking airplane and fly. Beaks first is class. also a weird character because it probably should be two people. Like, there's one guy. What? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, because it's they're, like, they're trying to corner the fucking orange juice market. But they don't. But the more people you have, the more. But people he's are also know what like their bag man and their their dirty tricks guy. But he's also like a 
works for the yeah. Is this guy anonymous or is not anonymous? He he was on TV. He was like yeah. they were like this. Clarence Beeks has the agriculture report. It's like, but everybody knows Clarence Beeks is on the the payroll. Mm, that is a good point. Ridiculous. I liked Clarence Beeks though. Me too. It's a swarmy motherfucker. Well, he's in the Butch's Girlfriend Award for the weak link of the film, which is the train scene. Um, first of all, Beeks. Why are you flying or why are you riding on a train where there's going to be other multiple passengers? How do you not recognize everyone right away and the blackface? Not, it's not not a great 10 minutes. Do you want to start the Richard Dreyfus Award for blackface <laughs> in the movie? You want, Let's do it. I mean, it's like... It's like, it's like <laughs> It, what is know, he? The Haile Selassie, like c- cultural, cultural affairs. Listen. And here's the thing, though. This is the, the this this is the this is like the thing. Wait, can you tell people what that meant? So Richard Dreyfus, Richard Dreyfus said that he he and you should play the sound. It's the funniest sound ever. He's very upset that he won't get to play a black man. He did a whole uh, interview a couple because well, the weeks Academy ago. Award changed the rules about diversity with cast. Or so he's whatever. very upset about that, and he's like, he said. Lawrence Olivier played a black man in Othello brilliantly, and it's he's really like, good. And thank you, Richard Dreyfus. <laughs> right, so now I'll you're sort of proving his point. <laughs> Anybody can do anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, but th- this is like what when I saw when I when I watched the scene, I was like, God damn! I hope Dan, Dan Aykroyd doesn't fuck up on Twitter. Yeah, because if he fucks up on Twitter. They are going to bring this scene up. Well, we're doing this podcast, so I think it might be like revisited, not to some extent, like to a little bit, but like. Well, it's one of the reasons I think people thought, "Oh, are you guys going to do Trading Places, or is that movie canceled?" It's like, yeah, there's a ah, they didn't there's know a few any things in this movie where you're just like that, that that's high and inside, you know. The the, the it's the eighties. Yeah. The homophobia in this movie is through the roof. Right. The it's just what it was when I mean, Eddie is like grabbing the woman's coat and he's like. You bitch. You bitch. Like yeah. he, he tries to talk to her. Yeah. And then she leaves. Oh, fuck you, bitch. <laughs> it's like, we could have made it, baby. You know, the whole thing. We so. talked about this before on this podcast, but to me, like, I like that this stuff is like this in the movie because this is like what 1983 was like. This yeah. is what flew. It's kind of instructive. Like some of this stuff wouldn't fly now. I get it. But in 1983, nobody thought twice about the blackface thing for years. It was. So there were, I do want to point this out. Yeah. Blackface has long been something that's been controversial in the community. I just think that the visceral reaction. I'm saying when to this it, movie came out, nobody was like, whoa, controversial blackface. Also, there, there, wasn't Twitter. <laughs> there, was, it was, there wasn't Twitter. But, uh, but I want to make sure that people don't think, oh, there was one time where black people weren't mad about blackface. Right. Black people were always upset about. I think the fact that Eddie Murphy is in the scene, if it's just Dan Aykroyd doing blackface randomly in this movie, people are probably like, what the fuck is well, this? But well, the fact well, that Eddie is in the, mo- in the scene with him doing it. Well, what 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 that probably made people think? Okay, if Eddie's okay with it, we should exactly. probably trip too. And like when I was a but kid, did you think it was a thing in the eighties? No, well, because I didn't know, and so yeah. I think that's the difference. So like I think that there's a more widespread consciousness and an understanding of what people are talking about when right. they don't want to see people do blackface. Then maybe there was before because we can share the information. The other thing is, it's just they didn't need to do it. Nothing like about the train ki- sequence <laughs> needed to happen. They Nothing. could have just gone to New York. Yeah. <laughs> but you it's had just, to. It's so like unnecessary. He could have played 19 other Billy characters. Billy could have like didn't need to be like beeps. a Jamaican. Like they did not need to do it that way. But this yeah. is like on SNL, like the next year, Billy Crystal's doing Sammy Davis that whole year and he's doing it. Yeah, it lasted in for a while. Face. By the way, it hasn't gone anywhere. It's still like somebody goes, no, nah, dog, I just wanted to play Jerry Rice for Halloween. And we're like, <laughs> we're trying to tell y'all the rules. Who, who, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I just, I just, I just wanted, I just wanted to be Jerry Rice, Rice for Halloween. And we're like, dog, we're trying to explain to y'all Can the rules. Can you imagine getting canceled because you decided to do blackface That's to be Jerry Rice? That's what the guy just Jerry said. Rice? What the guy just do? The, the, the dude who was the, some, it's always like an assistant comptroller in some <laughs> county in Tennessee that goes, you know, I just fucking really like Lou Rawls. And I was like, <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was fucking paying homage yeah. to him. And we're like, dog, oh, come on, man. I just fucking think Rocket Ismail is awesome, man. So I just decided <laughs> to go for broke this Halloween. Well, that ties mm-hmm. into what's age the worst. That was the first thing I had. You know, it was interesting. I, I ran into this on Amazon. For some reason, I didn't own Trading Places because it's been on so much. You just don't need to own it. And they have it at the beginning where it's like, end for nudity. Ask for strong sexual content. And they had a black blackface has now made... As a it warning, should. The it's thing a, at the top. I never noticed that terrible, before. But did you thing. notice that in the opening credits? Before? No, I did notice it before. But because yeah. I don't notice that shit anymore. Because sometimes I see that they'll have smoking in there. Oh yeah. And like when I was a kid, the only thing I looked out for was the SSC. 
Strong sexual content. That's right. Emmanuel in the desert. Which most of the Cinemax. time was a good thing. <laughs> Emmanuel, the most of the, the time desert. you're happy to see the SSC, but then like sometimes on Oz, it would be like, uh-oh, yeah, I don't know where this is going. Oz, you yeah. didn't want to see <laughs> anything. Made, oh, no. Going on All on right. Oz. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Uh, the N-word in this movie is used in a... Effectively. In an effective kind of a hammer so, scene. It's still jarring, though. Oh, yeah. You're talking about, like, at the end. No, and the Dukes. Them in the, when they're in the, bathroom. in the bathroom. Oh, yeah. so here's the thing. They do something in this movie that is... They do dual N-words, which is they do Negro, yep. okay? And then they do the big kahuna. Yeah. But even, Negro's the appetizer. Yeah, but even in Negro... The charging of the word. Oh my God. Is it's like so it's like the 1940s. In that, yeah. Like the charging of the world is so strong. You understand now why you don't want to hear it anymore. Yeah. Like the charging of the word is so fucking strong. A Negro. But that's one of the great things about how this whole movie is constructed is this old, old, old white world. Mm -hmm. Like that's why I like that wide shot of that room where, yeah. the, where uh, Louis gets, you know, basically framed. And they show the portraits and they're showing all like the founding fathers. Yeah, it's like when they're doing, when they're first explaining commodities to them and they've got like Jefferson and Franklin over Amici right. and Bellamy's shoulders. It's just like, it, yeah, they're they're not putting too fine a point and, on it. By the way, and that's another thing about this movie that's like interesting is that it also kind of represents a generation kicking out an old generation that they didn't like the way that they did stuff. Yeah. Because at the end on that island, it's a black guy, a guy who now has a felony criminal uh, record, and a prostitute. Yeah. You know what I mean? A sex worker. And this is like, hey, this is the 80s now, and it's yeah. kind of for everyone. What stage the worst? I had the impact of Jamie Lee's nude scene. It's hard to explain 40 years later. We tried. <laughs> The E.F. Hutton silence references have just aged the worst. Yeah. Nobody, nobody under 35 would even understand when it's like when they ask Billy Ray at and the dinner. And everybody leans and over. Everybody leans in. It's just like an E.F. Hutton joke. So when Winthrop and Valentine arrive at the World Trade Center, Winthrop says, in this building, it's either kill or be killed, which Shit. is aged the worst. They've taken that out of some of the TV stuff. It's not out of like the Amazon thing, but right. yeah, that's a little dark. Fuck. Um... And then there's some, there was some credit taken with this movie. Harris, one of the writers, said uh, it didn't have a huge opening, but it just kept going and going and going. I had a call from an agent saying he was getting calls asking if it was true that the whole film had actually been the producer on Russo's idea and then he just paid us to write it. Then I got another call saying Jeffrey Katzenberg of Paramount was going around saying it had all been his idea. That's how I knew it was a hit because people were trying to steal credit for it already. So there's a lot of credit stealing with. Oh yeah, I came up with training places. I told Eddie. Yeah, it was these two guys that. Katzenberg made it. went on to like not be very successful, so no. he really needed this one. Any would say, any would say, the worst beyond that. Yeah, I'll do the salmon here. You want to do it here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I love Christmas. I'm a big holiday season guy, but I think that this movie traumatized me and made me not like Santa Claus because. <laughs> Dan Aykroyd is so fucking gross as Santa it's Claus. The grossest. Yeah, it's so and terrible, I think that when I saw this at a very young age, obviously very excited because you it couldn't was eat salmon up. again. Well, I don't think I had salmon until like I was in my thirties, honestly. Yeah, but I never <laughs> sat on Santa's lap. I I never believed in him after this, and I always second guess guys who dress up as Santa because of this. And that's on my fucking life. I'm telling you the truth right, right now. This movie. Yeah. And this is the weirdest really thing I've ever you. admitted on the rewatchables. But it's I'm amazing. being 100% sincere right now. If you watch this dude with the gray, dirty beard, putting a big hunk of salmon in his coat, and then planting quaaludes on Billy and waving a gun around and then getting on a bus and passing out, you're like, keep me the fuck away from anybody who dresses like that. I was seven. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I couldn't handle it. He tries to off himself. Yeah. What, what, <laughs> right. what, what part of that is, like, I don't even know how I saw this movie, but what part of that would you be like, man, I can't wait to, to Santa Claus. I hope I hope he knows if I'm naughty or nice next <laughs> year. Don't know anything about me. Right. 
It's the grossest possible food. It's just the, the, the giant one salmon. Thing, yeah. just a, a the huge it's fishy hunk and of oily. Salmon. I think he looks and he's better the when he's the dressed suit. like Doctor Detroit in the beginning of the movie, <laughs> and he's being accused of having angel, uh, being an angel dust dealer. Right. I think he looks better than he does when he's in Santa. You got the hair from the beard, all in the. Oh, salmon. You got the hair from. He it's pulls the salmon so out on the gross. bus uh-huh. and starts to just eat and it, the, and the people are looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> I remember in the theater. I don't really remember much anymore, but in the theater, that was one of those where people like audibly groaned. Yeah. In the theater, like, oh. Is he starving? Doesn't he live with Jamie Lee Curtis? Why does he need food? He just he's hates drunk. Him. Yeah, he's just, drunk I'm and he just hates himself. Take a whole yeah. 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 Obviously, well, you know, you guys know what my age is the worst. I got to go with blackface for a thousand there. Yeah. We had that in there. Right? I'm just making sure. Doubling down. Doubling, tripling down. I'm an Stop ally, so I would also say blackface, it. but I just, I also got traumatized by Santa Claus. No, I get it. <laughs> Because the salmon situation, I I, I fast forward past it. That's so nasty to me. Yeah, I just I, I mean, taste the the fucking beard and the. Would salmon. you give it the Ron Burgundy Flute Award for best time for a pee break? So no, I would actually. I, I the pee break for me is the train. The train, yeah, the train. If you can see the train once in your life, you're like, I get it. It's the full John Landis. Like it's bad. Everybody's coked it's out. Like of their a bad SNL sketch. Scene. Yeah, yeah. Was there a better title for this movie? I'm gonna say no. Wasn't there, there was another title though? Is it black and white? Was the original screenplay title, yeah. I think. Trading Places. Yeah. Better. Trading Places, yeah, for sure. Best quote. Fear, that's the other guy's problem, I wrote down. Or when I was growing up, we wanted a jacuzzi, we had to fart in the tub. That's great. I think I think $5, maybe I'll go to the movies, movies. By, by myself. myself. <laughs> and then fucking Mortimer being like, half, half of, of it is from me. me. <laughs> Like and he's incredulous. He's so he's like he's like two fifty. I gave you that. <laughs> All right, the Stephen A. Smith hottest take award. Can I go first? Sure. So yeah. the whole criminal enterprise of the Dukes is that they're going to steal the crop report. Yeah. And then Eddie and Ackroyd steal the crop report. Yeah. So my hottest take is: shouldn't they also be in trouble? Shouldn't they get arrested for insider trading? Didn't they cripple the American economy and oh, this is interesting. artificially yeah. inflate or distort the orange juice futures market? <sighs> so did. you think five years later they go to jail? I think that's the Z-Want Neo is that the FEC shows up the next day or the SEC or whoever shows up the next day and it's just like, you guys are in trouble. You, you After mean they find me. Beaks in Kenya in 1986. <laughs> right. You mean, you mean the Beaks is like, these guys stole my briefcase. You're telling me that the Dukes don't have some lawyers on, on retainer who are going to be like, look, here's what happened. We can cop a plea, but we're going to get to the to the bottom of the corruption here. Hmm. I mean, yeah, they, they are exposed, but I feel like the Dukes might be well no because if you can do that like the the, the government is going to work with you if you have that type of information Just, I didn't think about that one. good hottest take you have one um my hottest take is a mixture of like a hottest take and a recasting I don't know why this hit me last night yeah Chevy Chase would have killed in the that's part. In the, yeah. yeah Chevy Chase would have killed those guys were on each other's corner a little more than I think people yeah like, I, like yeah. when I was watching the movie I kept seeing Chevy Chase for some reason and I'm like oh, would, would Chevy Chase have actually been better but mm. no he a, kind of plays in Spies Like Us like he plays more of the Eddie Murphy part like the looser mm-hmm. wilder guy to Ackroyd straight man so I, I don't know how many times Chev- Chevy's played like a straight man before? But it's a good, it's a good point. Mm. I would have liked to see it. My uh, my Stephen A. Smith hottest take award: James Harden should be ashamed of himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was a disaster. <laughs> He's gonna go to Houston, sign a free. I'm sorry. Uh, my <laughs> hottest take is actually <laughs> fucking. This is near and dear to my heart. As you know, I don't think Home Alone is a Christmas movie. Uh huh. You don't think Die Hard's a Christmas movie either? Don't think it's a die. It came out during Movies the summer. Movies that take place at Christmas. He doesn't ha- What's a Christmas? Is Trading Places a Christmas movie? Uh, I think Trading Places is the most underrated Christmas movie. So please explain and how that's And I will ride or die with Trading Places being a better Christmas movie than Home Alone Wait, and Die well, Hard. Wait, well, it can't be because it's the fucking same thing. It has nothing to do with Christmas. What? Trading Places has nothing to do with Christmas. He doesn't think Home Alone has anything Santa to do with Claus Christmas. and the Salmon okay, and Rock so, Bottom and the Holidays. And, so this and, is my point. My point is a Christmas movie has to have Christmas as a central tenet 
and theme of and the movie. And I would movie. say this is more central in this movie than it than is in Home fucking Alone. Than Home Alone. Die they're, Hard. They're going on. I, first of all, I don't. I, if you want to say the Home Alone isn't a Christmas movie, when I say Christmas I'm, movie. My, point, my real point is all three aren't. Aren't Christmas movies, but if we're gonna count all of these, if it's like a Jason, uh, nobody was adjacent, arguing that this isn't a Christmas movie. I think if we're gonna say Die Hard and Home Alone are Christmas movies, then give me Trading Places, then I like it more as a Christmas movie than either of them. That's my hottest take. I don't even know if I totally. It's the hottest it. take, but I, I just, I God only knows what you define as a Christmas movie. You've never been able to give me a Christmas that. movie. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Okay, that's so Christmas having movie. Christmas in the title, is that a prerequisite? No. Christmas is the whole point of the movie, is my point. Fucking Home Alone is about Christmas. No, it's, it's about- It's It's about a little kid who fucks with these two crooks because he got left about, alone. It, it's literally- Home Alone 2 is a Christmas movie. Home Alone is li- could have happened on the 4th of July. They could have gone on 4th of that's, July that's situation. That's the thing. Die Hard could have happened in fucking March. It got released in but July. the spirit of Christmas is what gets him to understand <laughs> the guy with the shuffle. And I, I, I mean, kind of, I, I, sort of. And but, almost every single bit in that movie is because it's winter. But, okay, but... The reason why it's, Winter doesn't equate to Christmas. It could be a January movie. Like winter, He couldn't have done the party because it would have been a July 4th barbecue so, and nobody, he wouldn't have been able to put the mannequins outside. This is the best thing about Home Alone in terms of it being a Christmas movie. You is always that do the, this. You open the can of worms the and then family, you sit back yeah. and you just watch it. Is that the family us. is going on vacation it <laughs> because it's Christmas. So you can make an it argument. could have been there. going on vacation in July. It doesn't matter. Christmas doesn't matter. Whatever, whatever. To me, Miracle on 34th Street, Christmas Vacation, movies that are about the central theme they, of Christmas. They Bad literally Santa. do <laughs> go on vacation in all sorts of different ways in the, Christ, in the vacation movies. It's, it's fine, arbitrary whatever. that it's Christmas. <laughs> It's just a vacation. It hurts you that I'm right. <laughs> but this, but in va- but in Christmas vacation, remember the whole thing of the movie is him getting his Christmas bonus, right? So that he can build a pool. So what if it was his winter bonus or his New Year's bonus or is whatever? The, but see, you're now you're making the bonuses. No, you know, Chris, you, Christmas vacation with the Chevy Chase one. Yeah, that's like the in laws are coming. He's trying to get the lights. Every single moment in that movie Christmas is, is a Christmas decorating movie. for All Christmas. Right. That's the best Christmas movie. Um. <laughs> Casting what ifs. <laughs> this movie was developed for Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder. Shit. And then Richard Pryor um, set himself on fire while free basing cocaine. Yeah. And that ended that one. And they got Eddie instead. Paramount was pushing One of the Eddie. great why he couldn't do it of all time. Because he set himself on fire. Well, it's just like cocaine. everything else is like scheduling difficulties. Life yeah. for this person not to be able to do Dune Part 2. This and then like Eddie was like, Burns. I don't want to be in a movie with Gene Wilder if I do it because that's like Richard Pryor's right. guy. guy. Yeah. yeah. So Eddie fucked over Gene Wilder a little bit. Didn't fuck him over. It was just like, but that would that make sense? I don't want to just Plus be he, in the Richard Pryor part. It makes more sense like this because them being a little bit youthful and climbing it's the ladder a little bit. Yeah. yeah. But that's why uh, the guy's a Vietnam vet in the beginning and stuff because they thought it was going to be Pryor. Paramount did not want Aykroyd. And uh, <clears throat> they just felt like he was part of a team and his movies hadn't done well. So he took a pretty major pay cut to be in the movie. Landis was like, I want Jamie Lee Curtis. Paramount was like, no. He's like, I'm casting Jamie Lee Curtis. So that happened. They wanted this old actor named Ray Milan for Mortimer, and he couldn't pass the physical. Jesus. And they went and found Don Amici instead. And there's this whole crazy story that you Amici, can Google. Amici like, didn't have a phone. And yeah, like, they thought he was dead. Yeah. He was like, Don Amici's dead. It's like, no, he's alive. <laughs> he hadn't acted in 14 years. They hunted him down, talked him into coming out of retirement. Does this, does Cocoon the next year, wins the Oscar. Yeah. All because Ray and he's married didn't to Jessica pass Tandy? a physical. No, that's Hugh. Hugh, that's right. Whatever. Yeah. Wait. Hugh Handy. Don Amici won an Oscar for Cocoon? Yeah, a year later. Shit. I don't, yeah. I, I, that, All because Ray Milan passed out his uh, missed his physical. Jesus Christ. Beaks was, good. was supposed to be G. Gordon Liddy. This is Liddy. my favorite casting what if of all G. time. G. Gordon Liddy. The actual guy was yeah. going to play him? And then he found out that the movie ends with Beaks basically becoming a, a gorilla's girlfriend and <laughs> said, no, thank you. I'm not doing that. Because, G. because that Lenny, was beyond the pale of right, him. Right, yeah, he's right, like, like, look, guys. <laughs> he didn't want to. So he, he turned it down because of that. Bugging Watergate. Like, like, Wait, that was the scent? Yeah. <laughs> the baggage handlers who became Franken and Davis were supposed to be Rick Moranis and Dave Thomas. That's awesome. Mm, that's and awesome. those guys couldn't do it. You mentioned Giancarlo Esposito's in the jail cell. And then one of your favorites is 
the young girl who looks disgusted at Santa Claus salmon eating the salmon, Edie Falco. Yep. Hmm. Huh. Who Cigar fell in love with in Copland. That's right. Copland. And she's smoking cigs and <laughs> looking like she's ready to have a bad relationship with somebody. Um, the Ruffalo hand and Ribbonick partridge over acting word. Tough one because this movie is so well acted and well done. But you- I have Wilson in the trading pit. Oh! <laughs> That's a good one. I was going to say Mortimer dials it up a tiny bit yeah. at the end. At the end. Yeah. When he's just screaming. I like it though. Yeah. Turn these machines back on. I like your yours is good though. That guy does <laughs> like, I don't know what's going on there. All right. Best that guy award. Cop number one of the two guys that lift Eddie up is that guy from Presumed Innocent and then Oz. Mm-hmm. He became the bird guy in yeah. Oz. It's pretty good. That's good. James Eckhouse, we mentioned. The, the uh, Mr. Walsh from 90210. He's the guy that tells Billy Ray made ma- bail. Frank Oz. That guy from Scent of a Woman who Pacino, his character, when they go for Thanksgiving and he's one of like the one of the one of the guys in that scene. He is one of the guys, Todd and those dudes. Yep. Does Beaks count? Beaks does not count. Not really. Because no. he's too he's too well established. Philip Bosco counts. He's the doctor who comes and sees Lewis. And then that guy from Airplane and Airplane 2, the wisecracking gay guy from Airplane 2. Yeah. He's in this. Do you think Bill Cobb is too, Bill, it's Bill Cobb? Yeah, it's Bill Cobb. So yeah. Bill Cobb is not a that. So Bill no, Cobb. Bill Cobb, a, Bill Cobb counts. Yeah. He's like Bill Duke. Um, who do you have? I have Philip Bosco. Okay. I had Beaks, but I get it why. I get why. He's, you know, comes back and. I have cop number one. I don't, I still don't know what that guy's name is. Dion Waiter's a word. I'll give you Penelope, quote, Muffy Witherspoon. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you Jim Jim Belushi. I'll give Franken, you uh, Franken too. Franken and Davis, and mm-hmm. I'll give you the yeah. Come guy. on, there's one more. Who? Uh, Bo Diddley as the burn my fingers. <laughs> In Philadelphia, it's, it's worth fifty dollars. <laughs> burn my fingers. That's who you want to give it to? I'd like to give it to Bo Diddley. Yeah. Okay. Not Jim Belushi. Yeah, I'm good. Not nothing. No disrespect to Jim Belushi. I go with Franken. Recasting couch? Would you do anything differently? Dude, I, the only thing was the Chevy, Chevy. thing. Okay. Yeah. Half fast internet research. We did the Amici thing. So the sailboat they're sailing is still in the Caribbean today. It's called the Tandemir. It's a 56 foot boat. What island was it? It's uh, Virgin Islands. Hmm. Um, what a time for buddy movies to go to the Caribbean with this and Running Scared. Oh, yeah. well, I guess they go to You Keys. and I'm Running Scared rewatchables? Love Running Scared. Okay. Michael, Mac- down. Michael McDonald. Murphy really liked the script, um, asked if he could change a couple of his lines because he thought there was some stereotypical stuff in there. Um, one of the things he put in was the cools line. Who put, the, who put their cools out of my Persian rug? <laughs> and the studio wanted them to take it out because they thought it was racist. And then Eddie and Landis fought to keep it in. And it became an iconic line. <laughs> what was it? Wh- wh- why racist? I this is Paramount. Is 19, the cools. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Paramount's like that's racist, but the black face. That's cool. Keep yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, the barbershop barbershop quartet song is an American Civil War song called Oralia. They look like some Confederates. The number given to Dan Aykroyd in his mugshot was the same exact number given to Jake Blues and the Blues Brothers. Oh, that's a cool suit. Little homage. Cool shit. They used a bunch of uh, actual traders in the scenes. Oh, you you probably saw this one too. Landis remembered Amici, Bellamy, and Murphy were talking about how many movies they made. Bellamy said Trading Places was his 99th film. Amici said it was his 100th film. And Murphy said, between the three of us, we've made 201 films. Yeah. Good and, one. And I remember Eddie Murphy talking about like, um, I remember watching the making of, you know, the making of thing is not a thing anymore, but I used to watch the making of yeah. everything. Yeah, and Eddie Murphy was being interviewed. And he was like, "You're listening to these guys talk about the movies that they've done." And one of them goes, "Well, when I was on Frankenstein," and he's like, "Yo, what am I doing yeah. right yeah. now?" You know what I mean? They had made so many films before. Amazing. So they made an Eddie Murphy role, the Commodities Future Trading Commission, in 2010, basically uh, to prevent insider trading on the commodities markets, and they've called it the the Eddie Murphy role, a little like the Alan Houston. Rule that they had for the uh, yeah for the amnesty. Remember they named the of amnesty rule after Alan Houston. The money clip thing when he fumbles the money clip that actually really happened. Don Amici had strong religious convictions. Did not want to say fuck him 
<laughs> so he said he would only do it once and he would not do it a second time. All right. Did you know the restaurant in the Weston Hotel in Philadelphia was named Winthrop and yes. Valentine? Okay. You knew, oh, that's awesome. This movie gets shown every year in, in Italy. Italy yeah. On Christmas Eve. And it's the most watched show on primetime every year. It's the Italians love trading places. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Apex Mountain. Tough. Did we, Eddie, we said Beverly, Beverly Hills Cop, right? Yeah, and I that think we culminates, that's yeah. the sort of peak of yeah. this run that he goes you know, I'd argue that coming to coming to America could be Eddie's Apex Mountain, too. It's but, it, but I, it's sh- Cop. He's he's the biggest star in the world after Coming cop. to America. I get it. But fucking gigantic. That's like Curry's huge. fourth title, not his. Damn, Craig. Um, Sorry, Craig. Remember yeah. when Curry won titles? Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, but it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely not this one. John Landis? He's feeling so cocky because he's the Eastern Conference Finals. He's just I probably like should dial it back. Throwing shots left and right. <laughs> John Landis? Uh, uh, you know what? That's that's a good shout. I think that's probably right. I mean, he was kind of going through a trial at this point. Maybe when he was filming this movie, this might have been his apex one. Dan Aykroyd, you think, we all think of Ghostbusters. I think right? it's yeah, Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters, yeah. How about Hoagie City, Chris? Definitely. There's so many Philadelphia spots. I mean, like, I think we should stick to the Philly 83 is Philadelphia's apex mountain other than the signing. Have you been to Hoagie City? I have not. Would any city have a place called Hoagie City other than Philadelphia? Probably not. I've never had a Hoagie. Like, what would really be considered? But, like, what's, it's got to be some kind of difference if it's a Hoagie, right? Uh, It's the bread, but it's South Philadelphia bread. South Philadelphia bread makes it a Hoagie? I don't want it. The Philly, <laughs> you know what's happened with the Philly food stuff, right? Uh, no. It's just, you know, they're like cheesesteaks. It's like fucking, what are you a, talking about? It's a sub roll with cheesesteak and this milk and cheese. Right now? So, 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 Land, so just to let you guys know, Land is directed coming to America. Philadelphia is one are of the best sure? eating cities in this country right just, now. Just, are you sure that coming to America is not John Landis' Apex Mountain? Are you sure, bro? I, it's hard for me to give it to him because I, I did, he did have a murder trial before that. I'm, I want to go pre-murder trial for him. For but Spot. it's the quite simply the biggest movie he's ever directed, right? You don't think Animal House might be his, his apex? Does it change movies in some ways? Well, it's, it's the question of when did he have the most juice? Is, okay. is what you feel like for Apex, not just the biggest you ever Yeah, it's like when around. when could he have done any project he wanted? It's mm-hmm. probably after Blues Brothers, honestly, because Blues Brothers did well. Mm. Who knows? Amici and Bellamy, no. How about Philly movies? Is it Rocky III? Uh, no, I mean, this is this is my favorite Philadelphia movie by far. You can make a case this is the Apex Mountain for Philly movies. Sure. Yeah. Best, but this, like, is like 81 is Blowout, right? Yeah, but this was so. But I'm saying that early '80s in Philly is like a real, real. It even has the four-minute Philly montage, and I don't know. Philly's just so. This is my favorite. This is a Philly, Philly. It it, it almost has to be Philly. Yeah. What about Creed? Throw Creed in there. I love Creed. Creed's Creed's good. Twelve Monkeys. It's good. Oh, that's Twelve Monkeys is in Philly. How about eating salmon in a Santa Claus suit? Apex Mountain. Pass for sure. Paul Gleason Breakfast Club. Yeah. Commodities. Yes. Oh no! Yeah, absolutely. Did you like, ever think about frozen orange? Didn't juice? Didn't even know what they were. Concentrate they before no or after? Clue. I had no idea you could trade frozen orange juice. I thought the whole point was that it was frozen. The other thing is there was no internet when this movie came out, so you're just in the theater, like, okay, uh, all right, then, <laughs> I, 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 I have money I, I, now. You cool. Thanks, like, guys. Like, like, okay, <laughs> well, if you guys say so. <laughs> the other thing about the scene is it's so chaotic of how they're doing the deals, where they're just like grabbing pieces of paper, mm-hmm. and it's like it doesn't seem like it's a very official process. Like they're doing a hey one. One, one, two, like they, they're, they're doing the whole selling thing. Best racehorse name. Billy Ray Valentine is just a great name. I don't know if that's a racehorse name, but it's it's, it's good. It's Billy Ray Valentine. I have Constance is one of the by better. the lake. Constance, oh, Constance by the, by the lake, lake is for is Philly. Oh, really that's a awesome. good one. Picking nits. Oh, I can't wait for this. I have some good ones for you guys. How rich was Winthorpe to have such a great butler? Because they replace them, and it's like, it you're making 80000 a the year. The butler works for the for Dukes. Them. Dukes. Yeah, that's why the butler can tell them what to do. The Dukes own the house, and they they essentially have the butler, too. So all of that stuff is coming with his, his so employment. So if I'm Winthorpe, I'm pro- probably worth more than eighty k a year. You give me a house and a butler. Yeah, but he's the MD of that firm, but it's like everything he does is paid for by the firm so they can take it away. It's like, like he's, basically being like on a 
fucking 10 day minimum. Yeah, it's not making that much money, but at okay. the same time, you get to fly mm. around and get all this stuff for free. Why did the Dukes live together? They're brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're brothers. They have a big family house. No, neither of them got married. They, they don't like. They don't have. They don't have. <laughs> neither any... of them are married. Have kids. They're just like. They're hey, probably too what cheap. are they like? Fucking stepbrothers? They're John cheap. C. Riley and Will Ferrell. They're 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 bros, bro. They have the love. Oh, of brothers. I need my meat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm guessing they're both widows. I don't. I don't know. I didn't that... get the implication. I thought that they were just like old spinster dudes. They who married have to the like... game. Yeah. Are snaking old lace, but they're men. You know what I mean? Two single old rich guys who live together? That's not weird. What are you trying to say? I'm asking you why didn't they have, why'd they live together? They're both rich. Why don't they have their own houses? Yeah, but. What's the point of living together? For, for the fucking roommates? They bunk beds? Yeah, they're, they're, best, they're best friends. <laughs> they sleep in the same room? What happened? By the way, do we know that they live together? Yeah. Because they, they get have the whole up. scene when they get picked up. Yeah. And they're they're, they're, they're getting they're, dressed. They're wearing matching outfits. It's yeah. good for the movie. Are we sure the Dukes are brothers? Did you go okay, Bill? <laughs> it's weird. Are you what's implying that Randolph and Mortimer are lovers? Well, first of all, if they were lovers, it wouldn't be weird. Prove we to me say. they weren't. <laughs> no, I'm saying it's it's they're two bro two rich so, billionaire now, brothers that live in a house together, have no family. They're not no billionaires. Spouses. They couldn't cover a four hundred million dollars short. They're definitely not billionaires. They're definitely not billionaires. For sure. All right, they're multi millionaires. Here's the thing: they have are drivers. Saying, they had eight. Eight people if, greeted if them. They are, the if they're in a relationship, not weird. If they are brothers who also fuck, <laughs> weird. Like so, so just. Well, let, we let, think let, they're brothers because they're both named Duke. Or they're definitely brothers. They're, they're, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, that's what I mean. So, so why do they live together? I think that they live together. Don't they live in like a really nice place, like where it's like they have lots like a of big, rooms? Huge it's house. not like they're like, oh, is it your turn for the bathroom? Yeah. I mean, they have their own way. Gigantic. And plus, this is probably like the Duke family compound. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That like fucking generations of Dukes right. have lived on. You know? All right. Do you guys know any other 78 year old brothers who have a ton of money and I think together? a lot of things from Just this movie don't, don't occur anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Salmon in the Santa Claus suit. How hungry do you have to be? I guess we covered that. Yeah. I wrote that one down. Like you really have to be drunk and starving. Why did Coleman switch sides from the Dukes to Billy Ray and Louie so quickly? Do you think he just hated the Dukes? I think that they saw him as a person. It's what we were talking about. They included him. So he he felt included yeah. and yeah. connected. Okay. All right. Would the local news really cover Clarence Beaks delivering the crops that's, report? That's a really, that's a great That's point. on Channel 4 at 7.05 p.m. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh, there's Beaks with the crops report. What channel? What? what there's nothing better? It's there like wasn't a shooting news. that day? Yeah, right. How do they actually fake the crops reports? I mean, that's, a, that's they yeah. don't really show it. It's just like a, you have to believe it. Big briefcase with tons of papers. Like you have to then. Isn't it really forge. like the, the Dukes are like, give me, distill this down. Is the crop going to freeze or is it going to be okay? Um, If I'm throwing Beaks a suitcase of money and he's giving me the you crop support. Get a I, I, you, wanna, you have to see. I don't want to be in a dark garage where yeah. I have no idea if it's actually Beaks. If I'm a rich, successful guy. Who's in love with who my, lives own with my brother? brother. Yeah. Yeah. brother has, has an incestuous relationship with my brother. Right, has sex with and your sleeps brother. Sleeps in bunk beds. Never with him. once in my entire time of watching this movie have I ever never occurred this. to me. But uh, it's you a never movie thought, convention. Why the it's fuck easier to have them leave together? the same house than it is to go. First, we go to Mortimer's house. And Maybe one of the movies where two rich guys live together. And I'm gonna think of a whole fucking list and text them. I'm just gonna ask just to see how Google is doing. Movies <laughs> where two rich brothers two, live together. together. Live it's together. Step Brothers and this movie. It's Step Brothers was a comedy that was supposed to be ridiculous. This movie is supposed to be accurate. Any other uh, Night at the Roxbury? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Night one. at the Roxbury. All right, yeah. there's another one. That proves my point. Uh, any other uh, picking nits for you? I got one. Yeah. Um, especially in a post-COVID world, he's sick. And she gets into the bed with him as he's coughing and hacky. She's turned, she turns down her date. Right. Well, he says, that's how we used to get no down mask, huh? back in So the you 80s. had a little COVID flashback? A little COVID flashback. She yeah. takes off her, once again, <laughs> yeah. a moment. And then she she gets into the, I'm like, think you're going to fucking get sick now. And now you're going to be all it's in, But you have, to rem you have to understand that on the East Coast, from October until April, Everyone's everybody is sick, sick yeah. all the time. So then you guys just fucking get just, together and cram together. You just pass cigarettes around. and coughed on yeah. each other, and we just lived through it, and it made us stronger. You Jesus preemptively Christ. try to get the bronchitis look what, look what to get it built, over with. They built Bill Simmons. Yeah, on the East Coast, <laughs> we're right here. We're still kicking it.
<laughs> Sequel, prequel, prestige TV, all black cast are untouchable. It's got to be untouchable. If they ever remake yeah. this movie, I'd want to like a fucking Spring Hill. It's like, hey, we're make, remaking Trading Places. <laughs> shot it. Shout like, out to Jamal and all my people. No, like, well, like, I, like, just, I mean they just, are guilty of remaking right, just, shit. Just like so, just like out of nowhere, just a shot. Boom, boom, Spring Hill. What? How many things have they did remade they in the last <laughs> two years? Is that is white man can't jump there? Yeah, it did. Probably. They did do it. Okay. Yeah. Shout out to come out. House Look, party. Here's the thing. Um, no, they. This is one that they can't touch. I guarantee you. I tell you something though. I'm not sure that somebody won't try to remake this though. They can fucking die in a fire. <laughs> Don't touch this movie. Is this movie better with Wayne Jenkins, Danny Trejo, Catherine Hodd, Steve fire. Buscemi, Sam Jackson, JT Walsh, or Philip Baker Hall? Sam Jackson. I was thinking has a about place. what would happen if uh, Wayne Jenkins was there when Ophelia was talking about her T bills. <laughs> Goddamn, Ophelia! <laughs> I didn't know I was fucking Charles Schwab. <laughs> Forty-two thousand in T bills. They had some great planning for the future, girl. Raheem, Muhammad, and Larry told me you were careful with your money. <laughs> Raheem, Muhammad, and Larry. Raheem, Muhammad, Larry. Uh, I, was thinking about him. <laughs> I was thinking about him on the island at the end, too. As yeah. The, as the butler. <laughs> Goddamn crab and lobster. <laughs> um. I got all these crabs for the party. <laughs> <laughs> Just one Oscar who gets it. Eddie. Yeah, it's got to be Eddie. Eddie. Yeah. It's actually kind of, I didn't look this could up. Could it be the script? You could I just think script. that if, if you say 10% of it's that movie Eddie, is yeah. Eddie basically redoing his lines, then you can't, yeah, you can't sure. give it to the script over there. Question. Contrary and down. Best supporting actor for Eddie? Oh, I think, I think he's the lead. I know they split it 50-50 pretty much because it's basically well, let, Lewis We're, we're, we're trying half. to get him the Oscar is my point. So here's the best supporting actor that year. Jack Nicholson, Terms of Endearment. Charles Durning, To Be or Not To Be. Get him out. John Lithgow, Terms of Endearment. Sam Shepard, The Red Stuff. And Rip Torn and Cross Creek. And Eddie could have fucking Eddie cracked Nicholson that won. list. Nicholson won, right? Nicholson won. Yeah. Sam Shepard's dope in The Red Stuff. He's pretty good. I love that movie, bro. Guy in Blackjack gum. <laughs> Probably an answerable questions. Best Eddie in jail scene, is it this movie or 48 Hours? hours. I think it's this, but it's it, it's the two greatest jail scenes in cinema history. 48 Hours is more iconic, but this one is better. 48 Hours, 48 is, hours is a I greater think I agree character introduction. Um, is Jamie Lee the most realistic and lovable hooker with a heart of gold character we've ever had? No. One of the all-time movie tropes. No. Would you go with Julia Roberts? Else? Julia Roberts. Julia Roberts. Yeah. For sure, she like she owns that. That's Ophelia her. Had, like saved Louis's life. What did Julia Roberts do? She, she just emotionally saved, saved Richard Gere's life. Richard Richard Gere's life. Yeah, fucking she learned how to love again. So yeah, Jamie Lee like nursed Louis back to health, <laughs> saved his life and career. Did Coleman invent smoothies? Oh, that's a good question. Mm. Can't remember ever seeing a smoothie yeah. before this movie. You should get. We should see if Erewhon will start a, 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 a smoothie called the Coleman. Coleman. Yeah, for like thirty five dollars. Like salmon, scotch, <laughs> and crepes blended up. Can we get into just Beeks's fate? <laughs> <laughs> on the boat to the, Africa the like how long that is that trip like a like, month this, in the same way that it was like you guys don't understand in the 80s like some stuff like the Jamie Lee Curtis scene would just happen shit like the Beaks like that plot of just being like and then he gets sexually abused by a gorilla who takes him to Africa with him so what what do we think because I always wonder, what do we think is actually happening? Why me? is the gorilla at 30th Street Station in Philadelphia in the first place? Is is the gorilla actually just being like having like legitimate is he, sex? Is with he Beaks? actually fucking Beaks, or is he pawing Beaks Don't around? Don't look appalled. You just brought up I, Randolph I'm and Mortimer. I'm not appalled at all. I'm, I'm, asking, away. I'm asking what 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 do we think is actually happening to Beaks? Is Beaks what is he being? I think forced it becomes it's like teddy bear, but but it, there's no penetration. I don't know. Man, I, I don't know. I just don't know. He's got to break through the costume. Yeah. He's got to get through the costume. But then it's he ends up in like Connor on Succession. We can't know. We can't. <laughs> at some point, does anybody realize, like, wait, I was looking at that gorilla. It seems like there's it's a mask with a white guy underneath it. Nobody at but you any know what? point. They know that it's a white guy under there, so they let it fly. They have all of these pent up yeah. frustrations. Beaks is done, bro. Is Beaks alive in a year? No, bro. It would be a great. Like John Wick sequel is Beaks returning to America and having his revenge. 
I got a better Ooh, sequel Beaks or at too. least one that I like. Beaks falls in love back with the gorilla. Oh yeah. And it's <laughs> like Jane Goodall. Yeah. Right, right. And Beaks yeah. ends up living with the gorilla and then he can only have love in his life yeah. and romantic. It's Beaks, the gr- Gorilla Man Beaks. Is we the went movie. some different places in this podcast so Beaks, where I thought we were gonna go. Beaks is just peeing and shitting on himself in the costume for a month. Yeah. Like at some point nobody's gonna notice well, this. It's like I think the Franken and Davis level of uh animal care going on. Fair. As the exotic disease as well. Here's my favorite probably unanswerable question. Did Ophelia throw a little courtesy courtesy fuck at Coleman when they get the stiff drink? Like they're alone the whole day, right? She seemed like they had a little chemistry. Just a little something? It's not gonna little work. extra? No. no? no, no. <laughs> she's in love at this point, Bill. Do you think she's gonna... in love with Louis? She I kissed think, him once. I, yeah, but there was it built up. At the time that she by the time she got in the bed naked with him, it was already. You don't think fine. Coleman Coleman got it no. got it on? Like, like no, I think a little frisky to him. <laughs> What's going on with you today? <laughs> Best double feature choice of this movie. 48 hours is the easy. I have uh, Sullivan's Travels, which is a Preston Sturgis screwball comedy from the the 40s where a film director who wants to stop making comedies, uh, he dresses up like a homeless man and tours the country as a hobo. I got a really bad one. Silver Streak. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, <laughs> I like Silver Streak. I like Silver Streak. Yeah. Put this one with Silver Streak. That's like, good. I like you that. guys really no sold my Preston Sturgis suggestion. I have no idea what that is. Yeah, I didn't know what like, that, that was. That was a Sean fantasy moment. That's a, like, yeah, that, you that, need that, a that fantasy. Like, like, that was a, you and Sean could probably have that conversation. Fantasy would have loved it. For like a long time. I have no idea like, what I that is. I just got that on the Criterion Collection. <laughs> <laughs> Indian Red Zawan were what happened the next day. We saw it. Yeah, I guess it's more a question when like what, what do they do next? Next, like what happens when their money? Do they start their own out? firm. Uh, you think they get they, everybody's just like, oh yeah, these guys who miraculously predicted the orange juice market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. What happened the next day is they get arrested. Yeah, right. Yeah, and then affiliate admits something happened with her and Coleman. <laughs> 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 Louis just goes through the whole thing. Louis like, oh my god! Yeah, he just puts his Santa suit Fucking back on. Sam and yeah. Santa's back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what piece of memorabilia would you want from this movie? Um, definitely not the Santa suit for Chris. I have a Winthorpe's watch. That's mine. Oh, that's a good it one. Tells time si- simultaneously Stod. in Monte Carlo, Beverly Hills, London, Paris, Rome, and Stad. Like that's mine. That's a great like one. the 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 seven. So he makes eighty grand a year. Yeah, he makes eighty grand a year. Yeah. He has a seven thousand dollar watch. Hmm. That's some real NBA rookie spending right there. <laughs> like he, he like he, he, he makes eighty grand a year. He has a seven thousand dollar watch. Yeah. So that that's what I would take. I was thinking the Duke's one dollar bill would be good. The original one dollar bill that they oh yeah they bet, or the one that uh, Lewis and. Billy Ray, one of those $1 bills, like game used $1 bill from the mm. movie. The Coach Finstock Award for Best Life Lesson. I don't know, Don't Be a Racist Asshole. Probably. That's a good one. Yeah. And who won the movie? Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy yeah. won the movie. Do you think you'll ever try, what, like we talked about this a little bit, but do you think when you want to get rid of me, you're going to go full beaks? You're going to have me framed? Mm. Dude, like put your hand in the pocket <laughs> of the person to your right. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be so funny if there was a ringer meeting out there in the front and we're all like, put your hand in the person to the right. And then like Chris is fucking framed. I got PCP in my pocket. Got, like fucking Angel it, Dust yeah. PCP. It's not heroin. Yeah. <laughs> Angel Dust PCP. PCP. It wasn't heroin. It was Angel Dust PCP. All right, Craig. This movie came out uh, nine years before you were born. What'd you think? 11 years before 11 I was born. years. Um, I've seen it a few times. I like Trading Places a lot. I think it's a really good movie. But I have trouble placing it in terms of like, I don't know, I, with older comedies, like, do I think this is a funnier movie than Step Brothers? To me, no. But do I think it's a better movie than Step Brothers? Probably. S- because it's actually about something. Yeah. And, and you're also factoring in like when it came out, what it meant to the culture at the time. So I don't know. I, I felt like a lot of these older movies, you know, your breakfast clubs, you know, parenthood, trading places, like they were all about something. 
and they had like messages and then comedies now that I love like they're just like let's do bits yeah, yeah. like Anchorman I think is way funnier than this movie but is it a better movie I don't know I don't know how to answer that anymore you know what that's actually I, I was a really, really good take I was I like actually it. fucking pissed because you always kick me in my balls with my childhood at the end it's always crazy like oh it was good it's okay fuck it you know but that's actually a really good point because if you just talk, if you just talk about laughs then there are movies that just Anchorman is definitely funnier than this but it's yeah it doesn't compare in a quality movie yeah Craig, once again, this would have been, it would have been ninja like assassin of good Anchorman taste. would have been more like if you just let Eddie cook for two hours and twenty minutes in this movie. Yeah, the joke would have been five more bits of yeah. him. Yeah, five, yeah, yeah, just kind of like little. Instead, they're like, no, this is like a tight two-hour movie with an actual story. If only Jordan Poole had been that efficient okay. in Jesus, round two. Jesus. I'm actually like... okay with that take. Get Jordan Poole out of here. <laughs> <laughs> 